recommend you do not follow along with your calculator. It's tempting, I know. I want to do that myself. But there's a lot of material that we have here, and so watching the recording where you can pause and resume will lower a lot of possible frustration. Now, um, the first tip might seem obvious, but it really isn't. Um, I remember students showing me their TI-84CE, which was very low on juice, and they told me, oh, there's no need to charge it up. They've been at low power level for the last month. Well, time doesn't eat the battery life while it sits in the book bag. Uh, it's using the second calculate menu or graphing something like a definite integral, like FN int. So this FN int will devour battery power like a grizzly bear eating raw meat. Uh, they should come to the test well-rested themselves, and their calculator should be well-powered. So uh, speed is really a very uh, important issue, and uh, one of the best ways to get good speed is when you're looking at your graphing mode, that you'd want to be on simultaneous graphing, so you don't have to have one graph after another uh, sequentially. Uh, the other is, and this is in particular, um, for um, the TI-84CE that because of the pixel density, I'm going to go press second format, there is this cute feature um, called detect asymptotes. It's the very last the end there. And I would recommend that turned off because when, um, now what this is is really just a cute informal way to call it asymptote begone. If, if you had y equals tangent of x in a standard window and you were going to graph it, well, um, it is going to not, it's going to check every singularity if this asymptote was on and, and say, all right, should I connect the previous point to the next point? And if it's tangent of x, it's going to have a false asymptote there. So this would really speed up your TI-84CE with it off. And in general, I like to leave it off. Uh, so that the calculator doesn't have to deal with all of this. Um, now, in last year's um, AP Calculus exam, which I'm showing the picture of it right here, um, you can see the um, question here involves fish entering a lake. I'd like to point out, and the um, really a, a plug to the TI website, and I also included it on my presentation on my, um, my own website, there is a wonderful test prep resources. They're just excellent um, that you can link to that will talk about this problem in itself. We don't really care about solving the problem as much as using the tips, but it's a great way to bring out all of the tips. Uh, and so you're looking at these fish entering the lake, and so there's a sign function. And I've got my calculator almost all ready for that sign function to be entered which I, uh, I need a little help here to put that fraction in. Now, that can be done with a division key, or it could be done with the uh, alpha uh, menu, the shortcut. I'm going to hop onto this. And another tip that's really handy is to get to the very end of a entry line or a math template, type uh, second and then right arrow. And that will plop you. It's like your end button on your keyboard. And second, uh, left arrow, is, as you would intuit, goes you to the front. So we'll take to the very end. And I mentioned these alpha shortcuts. They're just so, so helpful. If I press alpha and then N over D, I could get a fraction right there and um, either enter or 1. And in tribute to Pi Day, we wanted a problem that would at least have it make a cameo, and uh, we'll put pi over 6. We're going to use it in, in terms of uh, x here. And um, now, that is one way. I'm going to go to the home screen and show you there's a little Easter egg, if you haven't seen this, and you're on an 84 CE. Uh, an Easter egg is a computer term of something that nobody knows about unless they open a door and surprise, there it is. And here it is. You can press alpha x. So here's an Easter egg, and it's even Lent, so enjoy it. Uh, you can just get it really even quicker on the, on the CE. So here we've got our function, and what I like my students to do is think about, well, if you're going to put this in, you'd expect by conceptually looking at this, 
If you stick a 12 in for t, it should be a 2 pi here, which should give you the same output if you stuck a 0 in. So I recommend as a tip that students explore the table and making sure things don't go bump in the night. Uh, now, oh, the other cute thing about this is 12 being what it is, why don't we take our table and oops, second table set and walk in steps of three so that we can uh, see the key points. And I'm just going to go to the table. And you're probably already noticing, if you're um, one of those who teach, that this is um, in degree mode, and it was probably staring at you in the face at the beginning, but it's so, so not obvious to many of my students, especially if they don't have the 84 CE, which is um, putting that right there. So uh, we do see that something spooky happening, and we um, might get alerted. The very first thing is, is go to um, check your mode if a trig function is behaving in a way that you're not expecting. Now we should see what we expected. So there's a lot of tips I just shared. Um, they're in, that, in the outline. I'm going to refer to them just in a minute. But I wanted to notice that my um, most beloved tip that I gave my students one year was, you can find the window, which is uh, a very difficult thing for many students, much more easily if you go to the table first as a habit. And then you can check the table and see, uh, OK, now I'm expecting from 0 to 12, maybe 35 is a peak. So the window settings are guided by the table as well as the context. So you know, 12 was a nice number, of course, to get there. And there we have my graph. So um, we, it helps with my x min and my x max. And so what I'm hoping to do is instill confidence and lower anxiety with students. And, and the window settings sometimes are very um, high anxiety producing. Uh, and uh, Zoom Fit may be a cute tip, but it's not necessarily a, uh, something that works all the time. Because if you've got a function that has vertical asymptotes, it's going to not help you. But the table first to the graph is a very nice tip that really will always help you. So uh, what we also looked at is um, the, so this is the, the number of fish enter, not excuse me, the rate of fish entering the lake. And there's a cute little, this is a really fun problem. There's a, a rate leaving the lake. And um, many of my students have told me, you know, when they see something like this, they just kind of freak out. It's not what they see in a textbook. And so we just mentioned, how do we lower anxiety? For AP calculus students, I just tell them, this dude is not, L of T is not going to have a happy little antiderivative you can do symbolically. So expect ugly. And you know, so when they look at this, they say, oh, hello, ugly. I was expecting you. So we're just going to um, you know, not, not you know, feel agitated. And we're going to go to y equal and put that in there. And this brings me to another tip. So I mentioned how uh, you can get um, the, um, the uh, shortcut menus. There's a cute thing called copy and paste. Uh, although it's not called that literally on the calculator. Now, I put ugly in Y0. Uh, Y0 doesn't have its hurt feelings hurt. It, it's been called that. And so I want to recall that. So I get where I need to be, and I hit second, recall, and then I just have to put Y0 in. So I mentioned these shortcut menus. Look what's under here, alpha calculate. And there's all the Y0s. Uh, or, or all the y's, and I'm going to go and either type a zero or, or use the select and plop it right in there. So um, that is a nice way to um, kind of uh, really uh, get some control over its speed. And what we've done is essentially um, looked at these tips on the list. So we can copy one, one through eight is what we've just looked at. Um, where we can use the table and we can use our second recall and our copy and paste. Now, um, what's nice is um, since you've got that in the smart view, I kind of like to see the, the, all the representation. So I'm going to hit this little button up here to have the three, uh, it's, 
used to be called the view cube, I think it still is, uh, uh, where I see all of these representations. And I am uh, going to hit the refresh button. Um, but what's helpful for me when I do a, um, a, a refresh is I'm going to um, have my cursor down here so it doesn't plaster right on top of, of where I, I'm interested in. Notice how the cursor covered this. But if I have it down here when I hit the enter or, or, or refresh it, it behaves. Uh, but you also have this as well, that this is another way to get screenshots or screen captures of your, um, uh, to get your multiple representations on your smart view. So those are, those are handy to be able to, um, to get the uh, uh, control of, the calc uh, of both. Now the next thing that's really fun is um, we're going to explore what's going on with these questions, uh, which is how many fish enter the lake over the five-hour period from midnight to five, and they ask for whole numbers. So um, it's really nice to notice this is the entrance, and oh, I should press graph, um, just for fun. There I did. Um, and this is the, the, the number that are entering. And um, excuse me, the rate entering. So to find the number that are entering, I need to have an accumulation function. Let's go to the home screen for that. And we're going to put in, um, now there's a lot of ways you can get this. Uh, mass number nine is their F, our FN int. And then it's also under the shortcut menu, alpha uh, window, which is the function. So you can get that many different ways. Uh, and I need, it went from zero to five. So the first five hours from midnight to five. And I'm going to climb up there. And did you notice um, this little GPS signal is saying, use the right arrow to navigate through the template. Isn't it tempting sometimes to press the down arrow to go there because I'm above it, right? Well, no, that doesn't take you there. You want to follow the GPS. And, and now I'm going to stick in um, the, um, the uh, Y1 in here, and I'm going to use that handy Y uh, shortcut template. And I'm, since Y1 was in terms of X, this better be in terms of, of X. And I have 153 fish. Uh, but that's not in the pond. That's who enters. Let's look at who left. And that's Y2. Now, if you notice, this, that was ugly function, right? So we're going to replay this. Now, if you have um, the up arrow pressed, you can go up into the history. Now, the history is really handy because what's nice about the history, if you're up in the tree, just hit enter and pluck the fruit down. Uh, and now you're on the ground. And you can just re-edit this. So we'll go to number two, uh, because that's the function that's leaving it. And we see that 30 fish are leaving, 153 are coming. So in the first five hours, uh, we can uh, kind of see that there are 123 fish in the pond. And it's really handy um, you know, to kind of get those concrete numbers. Um, and we've answered question A. We also would like to know, hey, what's um, happening on the average uh, part B of the fish that are leaving in the first hour? So if I notice that it was five hours for the 30 fish to leave, if I just divide by five, um, I can do that in my head too, but it's nice to you know, see I can just press divide by five and say there were six fish per hour uh, leaving on the average. Um, now, if I look at this function, um, what's very interesting is that uh, many fish decide to get out of Dodge uh, as time goes by. I don't know. Maybe their college closed or something, and they, you know, okay, all, everybody pack up and go home. Their school of fish, you know, it all closed. Um, so it's really going super fast away. Um, now, what's nice to notice is that that function um, the, um, the difference between them is very, very interesting. So we can get that in Y3. Let's put that in there. And um, so the number who are, the rate that entered is Y1, and the rate that left is Y2. So the, total, the rate of the total number of fish in the pond would be uh, the difference, and we have um, a graph 
very nicely seeing that this intersection is uh, what we might expect that zero. All that said, I'd like to share with you that I have these on my little calculator here, and all of that graphed beautifully fast on my emulator. But what is different about this is that when I have a, um, a calculator running on the processor in this machine, it's not the same as the fast as the processor of this desktop. So uh, the same exact settings as I just had, uh, and I went to 0 to um, 35, and I'm uh, uh, asymptote begone is, is uh, enabled, and so I'm going to graph them. You and I know because of the pixel density that this is going to be a little slower than on the, calc on the computer. Wouldn't it be great if there would be a opportunity to get that to even go faster. And as they say in Ben-Hur, ramming speed, let's get that. And this is it. What you do is change your x rest. So what's happening with the calculator is it was graphing every pixel, lighting it up, and connecting it to, uh, with, a, with a piece of line and coloring it. And if I say, no, no, do it every eight pixels, then uh, there we go. Um, we have a lot faster speed. So what's beautiful about this is that there is no loss in precision if I were to do a second calculate intersect. Uh, you now, these aren't looking beautiful, but the calculator does not care about beauty. It cares about speed here. So it's still just, um, um, it, it's just precise. And if I um, notice that x is, um, well, we wouldn't call it as pretty either, but uh, suppose we want to keep all of the digits of this X. Um, so what I want to be careful about is storing anything in X. We don't want to do it. So I'm going to second quit, and I'm going to type X. There it is. Now, if I hit the store button, and it might be nice to do this right here on the um, emulator so you can see it a little bit better, um, then if I store this and I um, uh, change my window or ask it to regraph, X is lost because X is always used by the grapher. So I'm going to hit store here, and now this is the content, and it's going into the mouth of a letter other than X. I'll pick A. Uh, open up, say ah. Uh, now A is that number. And if I were to um, simply um, regraph this, then what will happen is, here's a quick way to regraph it, uh, X is no longer that number anymore, and, uh, but I still have it uh, because I put it in A. And what I'd like to do is show that if you go to now the table and put A in there, um, you are going to see what we had probably assumed, that these are equal and that is zero. So we have a lot of power there to um, be able to, uh, to store that calculator value. Uh, now what is nice is that um, we've seen a lot of these tips right here. Um, now the last part of this is um, just a little bit of um, making sure that if you're working with an accumulation function that um, you know how to deal with it in a way that doesn't create uh, an issue. Uh, so the next piece is asking very simply, well, what is the greatest number of fish in the lake? Now, we know at 5 a.m. how many there were, and that was the difference. And if we were to um, graph that, and I can climb up into the history and grab this, and uh, change this to Y3, we could even recall the contents of Y3 if we wanted to. I'm just going to use Y3. Uh, I'm not surprised. Um, that is the number of fish that are totally in that lake uh, in five hours. Here's a really cool tip. You go to Y equal, and you just hit second enter, and that pops it right in there. I don't have to retype it again. 
Now, um, if I do that on the calculator, um, oh, now I don't want it five, I want it, I would really like this to look proper, right? We would like that to really be an X and this to be in terms of T. Um, just to point out, we could do that. Um, let's see if I can um, go to my Y equal. And what is nice about the, um, the uh, calculator is that if I did second recall, I'm just going to share that with you, and put all of the effort in to write it this way, that's what I would put on a paper. But the calculator would just be fine if I had this. And it will work just the same. And what's not what you want to do is go to second table and ask for it to show some value. Uh, unless you do it carefully. I would recommend that you just um, put this in, and I'm going to um, plop it. You know, you can plop it anywhere. Um, put this in. The table use the home screen as a table. Now, we would not be too surprised that zero does what we expect, and that, um, oh, this is cute. Isn't this great? That eight is, um, the bound, so but just between 0 and 8. So if I change this to 8, I can see, um, now it's eating, but it did. It took 81 fish are in the lake. And I would really like to test all the values. So I'm going to type in my A and see there's 135. It's the maximum number of fish in the lake. And if I go to 135 uh, on my window and 0 to 8, then I will see that accumulation function, uh, but do not ever do it without putting x res equal 8. And I think I have all three, oh, all four of those. What the heck? Now, it takes a while. On the emulator, it zooms by like Ben-Hur ramming speed, right? But here, it's going to take a little bit. Work on another problem if you're going to do that. But it really does show very nicely the, um, the connection and the maximum is happening where those intersect and when that's zero. Um, but if you really did want to use the table, not on the home screen, but on the, um, but on the uh, table over here, second table, um, this is very dangerous. Because this will ask zero through 12 and at, in, calculate all of those. Um, the grizzly is going to eat. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to ask. Now, my preference is the home screen. But if you'd like to do this, we're going to go to ask. And I would say it's a good practice to turn everything off and just check if your table is clean. There's no thing in the x value right there. Because remember, it chews. If it was something in there and I had y4 on, it would be um, a little issue. And now I'm, I have an empty table. So I go over here, and I can type in. 0, 8, and um, patience. There's a little indicator here telling you that it's, it's working, so you know it's busy. Uh, and so you can use the table, but you have to use ask. You can use the graph, but you have to use x to res equal 8. But you can also use the home screen and your, co your conceptual understanding. So there's lots of stuff that we did right there, and here it all is. Uh, and we up, went up to 16. Um, so, um, oh, had I done something very nasty uh, and wanted to ask it to do this, and things happen. You, you press buttons you don't realize in the middle of stress. And oh my goodness, well, let me just do this. Um, calculator got all shy. I'm going to go to second table, and it's chewing. It's hard to tell, but it's chewing, chewing, chewing. I can always press on, and it will cut any process. So if you accidentally ask the grizzly bear to, um, to eat a lot, um, you can cut him off. It's Friday, no meat for you. All right, now what I'd like to do, actually it's Saturday, but if you were in Lent. Uh, now, uh, it turned the ball over to you, Stuart, because Stuart has some even better tips. I think uh, they're, they're much more outside of the classroom um, uh, outside of the context of the AP Calculus text and, and using it for standardized tests and things. But you notice what I did was try to share with you things that were um, a, um, 
more of the um, general as well. So let's just make sure I can um, get some help with now. I have always found that this is the part where, Ray, I may need your assistance um, to share this. Oh, if I do this, I think it'll work. Um, I, I can do it. The, the issue, I think, is I have many screens up. And uh, thank you for being the wind beneath our wings, Ray. You have done beautifully done. OK, Stuart has the ball. All right, thank you for the ball. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, John. I'm going to go up here to share so that you can see my screen. And here's what I have. So let's see now. I'm going to minimize this part to get everything. I'm going to go ahead and minimize this. Can I just put this out of the way here? OK. And John, I want to say a special thank you that you compared the Smart View with the handheld on your document camera, because while SmartView can do virtually everything that the handheld does, that speed difference is is a huge factor. Mm -hmm. And so I like the document camera as well, because then the students can see exactly the same thing um, on my calculator that they'll be doing on theirs. There is so, a great advantage. Thanks for uh, pointing that out and seeing that. So. Um, I'm going to pick up on this handout that you can see on the right half of my screen. Um, it will, and I'm going to start at number 17 um, and go through the rest of this. I want to remind you that the handout is available at John's website, and the URL is on the handout. Right? Um, I'm just trying to circle it here for you to see. Um, and so I, I want to start by saying that often. Um, students are bringing, whether it be students or teachers, they're bringing their own calculators. I want to make sure we're all on the same page when we start. Do we all have the same operating system? Um, because if we're not running the same operating system, things can things can work very differently. And so on this 84 plus CE, um, OS 5.4 is the current one. If you are using a black and white 84 plus um, OS 2.55. So how do I see it? I am going to go here to the memory menu, which is above the plus key. So I'm going to hit second, and then memory, which is the plus key. And I'm going to choose number one, about. And you can see that I have 5.4. Um, if you don't have 5.4 or 2.55 on the black and white, I want to point out that John has also uploaded onto his website another handout called How to Update Your 84 Plus. CE Classroom Solution. So there are details there for how to do the update. Um, it will require the TI website, and if you're on a black and white, you may need to get some, you know, because of the older model, you may need to get some help. Um, but everything should be there for you. OK, so let's go forward. One of the things that um, <laughs> even when I'm not teaching a math class, I still will get students from around campus coming to me from their professor with an error message. Oh, my calculator is broken. I can't do any graphs. So let me show you what might happen. So I might say, well, what do you want to graph? And they'll say, well, I want to graph y equals x squared. So here, I'm, going to, I'm at y equals now. I'm going to go ahead and clear what's there. And let's see. You know, let's see. I don't have anything hidden down at y0. That's uh, a great trick, John, as well. I'm going to go back up to Y1. Whoops, I went too far. So let me hit Enter to come back down. Oh, that didn't work. I guess I better hit the arrow to come back down. There we are, Y equals X squared. And let's make sure I'm in a standard window. Zoom 6. Whoops, invalid dimension. Huh, what does that mean? And I might add that if you're on a black and white, it might only say invalid dim. I won't even tell you what dimension is. Dimension is a reference to the length of a list of data. Um, invalid dimension means that either two lists are not the same length, or perhaps the lists are even empty. But wait a minute. All I was trying to do was graph y equals x squared. I wasn't trying to do anything with data. But if you remember, let's see. Well, first I'm going to get out of this menu. There's not even a go-to, so I can't. I don't get any clues as to where the error is happening. So I'm going to choose number one from this menu. 
Let's go back to the home screen. But now let me go back to y equals. And notice that above y1, right up here, plot 1 is highlighted. That means that the statistical plot is turned on. When you press graph, the first thing the calculator is going to do is plot whatever graph has been defined. But you never defined a graph. So the bigger question is, how did it get turned on? Well, remember when I hit the up arrow key too many times and ended up on top? And then I thought the pressing Enter would get me back down, so I pressed Enter and it didn't work. That's because Enter is a toggle switch and turns the plots on and off. If I hit Enter, it's flashing on plot one. Right now, plot one is highlighted. It's turned on. I'll hit Enter again. It's still flashing, but you'll notice it's not highlighted underneath it. I want to make sure it's not highlighted before I hit the down arrow. And now that I'm now that I have plot one, I'm sure that all and I see that all three plots are turned off. I can go back to graph, and there's my y equals x squared. So that's a really important um, thing. And it may be, as I said, you know, it's just you know, students think their calculators are broken when this happens, and I've had it where some of them have gone for days before they were able to sort through this. So I'm going to look at another common error. Um, I'm now on number 19 on the handout. I'm going to go back to the home screen, and I want to do a complicated computation. How about 9 subtract 5? 9 subtract 5, and I'll hit Enter, negative 45. Uh-oh. Calculators never make mistakes, but, but the user makes plenty of them. So what went wrong? I thought it looks like 9 subtract 5, but negative 45, that's 9 times negative 5, not 9 subtract 5. Why did that happen? And so I want to point out that there's a negation key and there's a subtraction key. And sometimes when you use the negation key, they're not the same. And sometimes when you hit the negation key, um, you might get an error message, but then there's a lot of cases where you don't get an error message, and this is a classic example. So when your student says, how can I get a different answer than you do, then take a look closely at what they've typed. Look at, I've just typed, again, 9 subtract 5. And notice the difference in these two symbols. The subtraction symbol is a little bit longer. It's also a little bit lower than the negation sign. So it's really critical that you understand the difference between these two symbols, because when the student shows you the calculator, it will be very obvious if you are aware of the difference between these. Um, it's one of the first things I always look for when a student will say, um, my calculator is not working properly. I want to show you one more example. I'm going to go to y equals. I'm going to clear out the x, the x squared. And I'm going to type x subtract 3. But again, I'm using the negation sign, and I'm going to press graph. And the argument that, oh, students should not use calculators because they'll never learn any math, then I would argue that a student won't be able to use their calculator successfully if they don't know some mathematics first. Because I want my students to be estimating and guessing and trying to predict what the calculator is going to do. x subtract 3, that's a linear function. Isn't that going to be an x subtract 3? Well, that should have a positive slope. But clearly, this graph does not have a positive slope. So something went wrong. So again, I want to make sure that everybody understands. Let's look at these two symbols side by side. Notice the difference between x negative 3 and x subtract 3. And yes, the calculator can do implied multiplication on what's in y1, so what we're seeing is the graph of negative 3x. OK. So let's see, what else can we look at here? Let's go back to y equals. Let's clear out what's in here. Um, I'm going to start with something very straightforward. How about x? And I want to do a multiplication of two functions. I want to go x times x minus 3. I want to keep x in there. We're studying quadratics. So since we're going to study a bunch of them, instead of using, instead of typing x times x minus 3, I'm going to use y1. So if you'll remember, I can go to f4. There's a shortcut there. And I can get y1. 
and I want to multiply y1 times x minus 3. And here again, I'm using implied multiplication, or at least I think I'm using implied multiplication. And when I press graph, uh-oh, there's y1, is the blue graph, and my, my x times x minus 3 is the red graph, but that sure doesn't look like a quadratic. That looks like it subtracted 3. So, I, so all I'm trying to do with this tip here is to make everyone aware that built into the, into the operating system here is function notation. What we see there in y2 is not y1 times x minus 3. That's y1 of x minus 3 as function notation. We're plugging x minus 3 into the function x. And so we're actually getting the graph of y equals x minus 3. So just as a, as a way to understand a little bit better what we're looking at, I'm going to go back just so you can see how function notation gets used successfully. I'm going to go alpha y2. And how about if we say y2 of 7? And since y2 was x minus 3, 7 minus 3 is 4. Um, let's go back to y equals. And I want to point out that if you want to be safe, you can certainly use the y1. That's not the problem. The problem is in this when, you know, is y, implied multiplication is where the problem comes in. If you're wanting to do y1 times x minus 3, make sure that you're, that you're using a stated multiplication. Use that multiplication symbol, and in y3, we'll see the quadratic that we were expecting to get originally. Okay. I'm now going to go on to number 21, tip number 21. Um, we keep hearing the, the mantra that we should be always pushing and promoting multiple representations. I want my students to understand that something like y equals, and now I'm going to start over again here, clear, 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 so a graph such as 1 half times x minus 3, I want my students to be able to understand that this equation is also can be represented with a graph, graphically, and also numerically as an xy table. And so I'm going to go to mode. One of the features I love here in this TI-84 is that I can choose, I can split the screen with a graph table split. I've gone to mode. I'm highlighting graph table instead of full. Now, don't forget to say please. Notice it's flashing on graph table, but I haven't selected it until I say please by pressing enter. So now that I've selected, now that I've got graph table selected, I'm going to go straight to the graph, and I see that I get the graph on the left. I get the uh, table on the right. Let's go ahead and and. And one of the things I want to point out, to be able to get this, let's see, I have the graphical. I have the numerical on the right. If I press trace, I'll get the algebraic, all three on the same screen. But there's one thing, if I move to the right, here's something that I just don't like. And I don't like what I'm tracing, that I end up on such horrible numbers, such long decimal expansions. So there's a really nice little button here, a nice little Zoom feature called Zoom Decimal. So I'm going to go to Zoom Decimal. And what that does, nothing looks any different. At this point, otherwise I'm in a different window, and I can show you the window that I'm in on this split screen. Okay, We're no longer negative 10 to 10, negative 10 to 10. But the nice thing now is that when I trace, the increments are 1 tenth. And I'll land on integers, and the numbers are much more readable for my students. I want to say a little bit more about Zoom Decimal. And I want to do it in a full screen, not in this half screen that I'm in. So I'm going to go back to mode. And, and I'm going to scroll down. And I'm going to go back to full. And here we are. I'm back in my full screen mode. And I'm going to go back to y equals. And I'm going to change it to, let's change this graph to how about x minus 7 quantity squared. OK. And again, I always like to start every time in a standard window, negative 10 to 10 and negative 10 to 10. And while this is a lot reasonable first, 
first screen to look at, um, it really doesn't, I mean, I can see that it's a parabola, it, but when I press trace, I don't see, I don't see the cursor, I don't see the y-intercept. Um, and when I move to the right, I can, I can certainly hold it down and eventually I'll see the cursor, but again, look at how ugly these, these numbers are. So the first thing I want to do is help you understand where, the, what, where these numbers come from. Why is the calculator giving me, you know, when I, go, I start at X and I hit the right arrow key and I get this .151515, where did that number come from? So let's go back to window. In order to be able to, um, as I said on number 22 right here, zoom decimal is too limiting. It only gives me one window. It's a friendly window with nice decimal increments, but it doesn't always work. And I'll show you why in a moment. But first, let me first explain what's going on with this, where this number comes from. So let's go to window, negative 10 to 10. That means that the left-hand boundary is negative 10. The right-hand boundary is positive 10. That's a difference of 20. And what's important to remember is that, and I'm going to highlight this on the handout right here, that there are 132 trace step increments between x min and x max. Okay, so that means that the distance, that means that if there's 132 steps, then each step is 130 seconds of that distance. Now in this case, in this particular window, the distance is 20. So 20 divided by 132, Let's give that a try. 20 divided by 132, there it is, 0.1515, that's the trace step that we have. So the default window is a nice window, but it doesn't make, because the pixel resolution, it doesn't match it very well, we get numbers like this. And I should point out that Trace step and delta x on older models used to be the same, but there's so many columns of pixels now that that the distance between pixel columns is the delta x. Trace step is actually using a resolution of two. It goes to every other column, and that's why we'll always see trace step will be twice the value of delta x. So with this in mind, I'm going to go back to the graph and since built-in is zoom decimal, let's see what that does for us. Okay, if I go zoom decimal, I get a horrible window. I can't see the x-intercept. I can't see the y-intercept. I'm not even sure that that's a parabola. So I mean, I can press trace, and I can see, you know, I, the cur I see on the screen, it tells me where the cursor is, but I can't see it. I see that I'm We've got increments now that are nice increments of one tenth, but I still can't see it. I'm not pleased at all with this. So let's go to window. And one nice thing about what I see here in the window, and you can always determine the number of trace steps. And it's one thing that you can do with the zoom decimal window is look at x min to x max. Notice that it is 13 and 2 tenths. Well, 13 and 2 tenths divided by 132, that's right back here, I'm on the handout now, trace step is this 13 and 2 tenths divided by 132, which is 1 tenth. That's pretty nice. But it doesn't give me the window. It helps me see the whole graph. But now that I understand how this works, I can build my own friendly Gosh, I need to go beyond, I need to move the screen over to the right a little bit. So let's do a little bit of logical thinking and, and some, maybe some trial and error along the way, although I will confess I've already done the trial and error on this particular one. I'm going to change x max to 10, because that way I, my x-intercept will be displayed. And I'm going to let the calculator figure out what x min should be. Notice when I go up to x min, the trace step is now the horror, you know, an ugly uh, repeating decimal. Well, I know the distance needs to be, I'd like it to be 13 and 2 tenths. It could also be 132. It could also be 26 and 4 tenths, twice as much. There's lots of friendly windows. Let's stick with the 13 and 2 tenths. So I'm going to type 10, subtract 
13 and 2 tenths. So I'm going to back up. And when I press enter or the down arrow key, notice it does the computation, gives me an x min of negative 3 and 2 tenths. It, notice now my trace is exactly 1 tenth because the, the numerator of this fraction is now 13 and 2 tenths. Okay, let's go back to graph. Well, I can see my x-intercept. When I press trace, I still can't see the rest of the graph, but I do see when I move the cursor that I have friendly increments. Wouldn't it be nice if I could see that y-intercept and see where this thing crosses the y-axis? Now, what I see so many students doing is they'll go to zoom and you choose zoom out. And that will zoom out by a factor of four in all directions. And I don't want to go in all directions. I'm happy with what I have here on the right side of the screen. I certainly don't need to zoom down into, you know, downwards. And I, all I want to do is be able to go and see this thing up to the y-intercept. So I know that the y-intercept is at 49. I've already been able to determine. I've already got that. Again, I'm using logical thinking here, not these magic buttons on the calculator. If I, when x is 0, y will be 49. So why don't we just go to window and choose a window that will display y equals 49. Instead of a y max of 4.1, how about if we go past 49, I could use 50, I could use 60, I could use 75 or 100. There's an infinite number of windows that will work here. I'll try 60. Let's go back to graph. And now I can see the x-intercept, and I can see the y-intercept. And if I press trace, I can move to y equal, x equals 0 and see my y value. I can move to x, I can move to x equals 7, and by the way, I don't have to just hold the uh, cursor, I don't have to hold the right arrow key down. When I'm in trace mode, I, can, I know where I want to head to. I can just type 7 and press enter, and it'll jump to x equals 7 and show that to me. So I'm much, much happier with this window, but there's still one thing about this window I don't like, and it's the fact that my y-axis is really wonky here. I mean, I see on the x-axis I have tick marks that are one unit apart. Well, if I go back to window, my y-axis, this is x scale and y scale. x scale is one, y scale is one. That means the tick marks on the y-axis are also one unit apart. But we have a distance now of over 64. That means there's 65 tick marks, but there aren't enough pixels to give me equal spacing. It's, trying, it's, it's lighting up 65 pixels, but, there, but it's, what is it, 82 pixels, 83 on, on this up and down, on the, on the vertical change. Well, the exact number of pixels is not the critical part. What I want to do here is choose an X scale that will give me a picture that will make sense. So instead of having x scale equal one, y scale equal 1, I'll leave x scale at 1, but I'll change y scale, say, to 10. Go back to graph. And it's just a much nicer graph to look at and easier to read. But it's really important to remember that x scale and y scale are no longer the same. So it's critical to be able to go back and forth. And so I, when I'm writing handouts and I put windows on the handout, I always want to make sure that both that x min and x min x max and the scale are included. So notice in this in the uh, caption underneath this screen, I'm I'm trying to explain what this notation means. That I've got x min x max and x scale by y min y max and y scale. And so again, it's not just the left, not just the boundaries, but the increments are important as well. Okay, I think I still have a few more minutes. I got about five more minutes that I can go, and I want to have a little bit of fun with this last tip. Because when I first learned polar mode, I was in my first, third semester of calculus, and by then it was too late to get me excited. And then I got handed a graphing calculator that could do parametric and polar graphing, and the things I discovered were not 
for third semester calculus. And now I will do polar, I will do what we're about to do, I have done with third graders. As long as they know that there's 360 degrees in a circle, this is something that they can, can do and have a whole lot of fun with. So I'm going to go to mode. I'm going to change radians to degrees. I'm going to go and change function to polar. I'm also going to go to format above the zoom key and change rectangular coordinates to polar coordinates. And I'm going to go to y equals. And I'm going to look at the graph of r equals 4. Well, let's start out with a zoom standard. Like I said, I always like to start out with zoom standard. And here I get what looks like an ellipse. Well, what's going on? I mean, that doesn't sound like the equation for an ellipse. So let's go to window. And we've got to remember this. I thought this was going to be a circle. And here is my standard window, negative 10 to 10, negative 10 to 10. But we've got to remember, with a little extra here that we'll get to in just a second, but we've got to remember that negative 10 to 10 is, um, this is not a square window. You know, it's, it's wider than it is tall. So here's a case where if I want a circle to look like a circle, I better go, ooh, I better go zoom four. By the way, I should do something. I'm going to back up just a moment. Forgive me for this. But I want to go back to radian mode. I'm going to do a zoom standard again. We'll get the same picture, but we're now in radian mode. So I'm going to now go into degree mode. And I'm going to go straight to zoom decimal to get that square window. And look at this, it only gave me this little bit right here. And so zoom decimal, I'm in degree mode. Yes, it gave me the friendly window that we see in zoom decimal, but notice that theta min and theta max are 0 to 2 pi. In other words, zoom decimal doesn't recognize that I'm now in degree mode. So let's do this in two steps. Zoom standard and then go zoom decimal. And we can go back to the window. And now, instead of 0 to 2 pi, we're 0 to 360 degrees. So let's explain what this theta step 7 and a half is. I see a circle. I'm going to press trace. And I have my polar coordinates. My radius is 4. My angle is 0. As I press the right arrow key, I'm going to move from theta minimum to theta maximum in steps of 7 half degrees. And the calculator is plotting points and connecting the dots with straight lines. So technically, this is a polygon, not a circle. But the resolution is good enough that it looks like a circle. I could make the resolution better if I made theta step equal to 1. But it won't look any different. And Notice how fast it filled the circle in. This is another case where on a document camera, if I were using my handheld, you would notice that by, when I switched it to x to theta step equal 1, it would go much, much slower because it has to plot 360 points in order to do it. Well, this is where the fun comes in with elementary kids just learning geometry or even middle school and high school learning geometry. What if I was to make a theta step of, whoops, I'm sorry, here I got out of there. What if I was to make a theta step of 90 instead of 1 or 7 and a half? What's that going to do? It's going to plot points every 90 degrees. That means it's only going to plot four points and connect the dots. Whoa, my circle has now become a square. It's been rotated 45 degrees. Let's press trace and we'll go around the circle and we see a square. Notice it stops. I can't go past 360 because that's my maximum. See, can I do this and get a hexagon? What would it have to be to get a hexagon? Well, a hexagon has six sides, so one-sixth of 360. It, each point must be one-sixth of the way around the circle. And so 60 degrees, and I press graph, and I get a hexagon. Cool. This is, I just love being able to play with this. And what if you don't know how many degrees? Um, for example, maybe you don't know what the step should be for a pentagon. Well, you know that it needs to be one-fifth of the way around the circle. So just type 360 divided by 5. 
five, and you get one fifth of 360. When you hit enter or the down or an arrow key, it'll give you 72. And there's my polygon. There's my pentagon. And I'm, this is where I'm going to leave you, and I want to encourage you to explore a little bit, especially try exploring theta steps perhaps that are not factors of 360. What if I was to say 107 and press graph? Well, that doesn't look like much. I press trace and I go 107. Notice I can only get three points and it doesn't complete. But what if I were to say, don't stop at 360? Let's go on. Let's go up to 3600 instead. And we can start getting some really nice pictures. And I tell you, the kids are going to be interested and they're going to want to do more of this. Well, I could spend a whole hour just talking about variations on the polar graphs, but I think I have used up my uh, used up my allotted time. So I want to say thank you, John, for doing this with me. I love working with you, and Ray. So thank you so much for for uh, moderating this. I sure wish we could have done this in uh, Dallas face to face, but uh, it wasn't meant to be this year. So I'm going to take us back. I'm going to close this, and I'm going to close this.